Good morning, all. Um, it's, uh, it really, it's an honor uh, to be here and a pleasure to see so many uh, familiar faces um, and uh, to meet some new folks as well. Um, it's exciting when you come uh, upon a way to do something uh, which was initially thought to be impossible. And I'm going to share with you today such a story, um, a, a career arc that uh, goes through several phases in addressing um, ocular abnormalities in uh, folks with uh, nori disease. Starting originally with the combination of our clinical and surgical work and uh, more recently uh, our laboratory work. And um, we'll be chatting about all of those things today um, and there'll be plenty of opportunity for discussion. So. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll address some of the questions you have. My name is Tony Capone. Um, I'm a pediatric vitreoretinal surgeon uh, and clinician scientist. Uh, I grew up uh, about an hour from here in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, you know, kind of maybe an interesting place to start is what's a pediatric vitreoretinal surgeon and how do you get to be one? So um, uh, I did my undergraduate and medical school training uh, in Providence at, at Brown and my internship at Yale and did my ophthalmology residency where you learn how to be an eye doctor, a general eye doctor at the University of Pittsburgh. Then I went to Emory University in Atlanta uh, for further training in uh, diseases, managing diseases and surgery of the retina and vitreous. There is no formal pediatric subspecialty training um, uh, in retina. Uh, it's at the moment the kind of thing that you do if you have an interest. Um, uh, in candor, most of the diseases are too rare uh, to have training programs specifically addressing them. Um, shortly after I finished my training uh, at Emory, I was smitten with the passion uh, of working uh, on behalf of children with potentially blinding retinal diseases. So this is a picture from about 25 years ago, and guys like that little guy in my lap these are my people. <laughs> um, long before I met my bride and, and had my own kids, uh, kids like this little guy, kids like your kids, um, uh, I adopted as my own as well. And that's still true today. Um, my journey from Emory, after where I worked for about 11 years, eventually took me to Associated Retina Consultants in, uh, in Michigan, uh, where um, I worked, I joined Dr. Michael Tracy, the gentleman uh, to your upper right, uh, a pioneer in the surgical management of retinal diseases. Um, and uh, we trained and then brought on, uh, uh, quite some years ago now, uh, Dr. Drenzer. Uh, she's a P MD, PhD in molecular genetics from Stanford uh, and a cracker, absolute crackerjack of a surgeon uh, as well. And uh, this, is, uh, this is our team. Uh, for the past, uh, two decades that we've been together, my partners and I have had the largest, most academically productive pediatric retina practice in the world. During that time, it's been our privilege to make contributions which have preserved vision for many infants from a variety of, uh, uh, with a variety of diagnoses from all over the world. We also train physicians from all over the United States and from all over the world. Um, Unfortunately, not all pediatric retinal diseases fare well, I think, as everybody in the audience here is uh, exquisitely aware. Uh, uh, many kids still go blind, and light perception vision, which we are fortunate enough to save uh, at times, is good, but we all want more. <laughs> One of the most difficult parts of the job is to deliver bad news in a compassionate way, especially to, to young parents. And I know that both of you, many of you, have sat on the receiving end of those kinds of uh, conversations. And it's important to celebrate victories, and we get victories. But the desire to do better is really what fuels the resolve of my partners and I to work to develop treatments for these diseases. So in the time that remains, I'll share with you the, the story of our path, uh, or our, our, our over time, um, and where we yet hope to go uh, in the future. So. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on history of Nori disease because I think everybody here knows how to Google and has probably Googled at length. Um, uh, but Nori disease was described in the uh, 20s uh, by Dr. Gordon Nori. Uh, very rare. 
uh, amongst the pediatric retinal diseases that we take care of, and there's, I'll show you what the universe of our uh, sort of interest looks like. Uh, Neurodiseases disease is really among the rarest. Um, and oh, what's the impact of that? Uh, even a busy vitreoretinal doctor will probably see three, maybe four per, uh, children affected with neurodisease disease in the course of his career or her career. Um, the other condition that we tend to that's a bit more common that has many similarities with regard to its ophthalmic findings is a condition known as familial exudative vitreoretinopathy. And some of you may have heard of this as well. It's common in the list of what, in our jargon, we call the differential diagnosis of Norrie disease. Differential diagnosis is kind of the medical equivalent of lining up the usual suspects. So many of you, I think, in our conversations, and, and I know this from what I do, start out uh, with the concern that your child may have retinal blastoma uh, based on their clinical appearance. That's one of the usual suspects. Um, Nori disease, fever, persistent fetal vasculature, and even retinopathy of prematurity, if your child is at all premature, is another consideration. Fever does share a lot of features, though, uh, with Nori disease, with the main difference, again, that it is largely relegated to only eye disease, except for a, a very rare mutation um, that is probably about as rare as Nori disease, known as uh, osteoporosis pseudoglioma. Uh, syndrome. And those children also have, um, as you might gather from the osteoporosis part, they have uh, uh, bone issues as well as cognitive issues um, apart from their eyes. Well, let's talk about the, f the first kind of uh, uh, body of work with significant impact on uh, Nori disease. And it has to do with uh, surgical management of the disease. And the surgical management of Nori disease really traces its roots to the surgical management of retinopathy of prematurity. And um, but why is that? Uh, and simply put, it was much more prevalent. So there were a lot more kids who had it. And when, when that's the case, that's kind of where medicine as a whole will cut its teeth, if you will. So retinopathy of prematurity really <clears throat> first seen in the 40s, a consequence of being able to keep children alive uh, when they were very premature uh, with the use of uh, incubators, ventilators, and oxygen supplementation. Um, and while the children would live, many of them would live to develop a blinding eye disease, retinopathy prematurity. Many of the surgical inroads in the management of retinopathy prematurity, though, had to wait until the 80s. Why? 40-year gap. Well, until the 70s, um, retinal detachments and retinal pathology was largely fixed by operating outside of the eye. And from what I'm going to show you in, in what follows, you'll see that the detachments in this group of conditions that have, have fairly similar anatomy is really due to scar tissue on the inside of the eye. And you really need to get on the inside to be able to fix it. And it really wasn't until 1970s or so that we even began to go inside of the eye. And then probably another 10 years after that, until the instrumentation became fine enough and understanding of the mechanics of the detachments, why folks detached and what the structure was, it took another 10 years really before some of those innovations started to occur. Um, Dr. Tracy was really the tip of the spear uh, in this. You know, pediatric retina had a few uh, champions that some of you have seen some of those folks, especially with, uh, you know, uh, uh, old, you know, adults with Nori disease. Uh, so uh, Hirose and Scapins, who you just saw, who was practicing here in the Boston area, actually established one of the biggest practices um, historically uh, in retina, of historic significance in retina right here in Boston. Um, uh, and in the more modern era, Dr. Tracy and, and I and others. So I, I alluded to the universe of uh, diseases that we tend to as pediatric uh, retinal specialists. These are they. There are a few others that are rarer still. The ones that have fairly similar um, anatomy with regard to their detachments are listed here now in bold. And of these, the most common until recent days was retinopathy of prematurity. As recently as five years ago, 80 to 90 percent of the surgery that I did for complex retinal detachments was in retinopathy prematurity. Now with further advances with regard to the management of high-risk neonates, um, the uh, incidence of uh, retinopathy prematurity with regard to how many children I operate on with that as opposed to these other conditions is now equal to the other conditions because the retinopathy prematurity detachments have dropped. Um, a big, big change. So. 
we need to develop a little bit of a uh, visual vocabulary, if you will, so we can talk about some of the structure of these attachments. So bear with me as I walk you through some of that. Um, so this is obviously a graphic of a cutaway, a vertical cutaway of the of the eye. The eye is, uh, and but this is going to sound familiar to the folks here who uh, uh, whose children I've taken care of because we've had these conversations, and this you all know this is way better than the drawings that I do for you in my little room. <laughs> a better doctor than a, than an artist. But um, so the eye is a hollow sphere. Um, the uh, sphere has a lining, as if you if you sprayed latex on the inside of a basketball, that latex layer, that orange latex layer, would be the retina. And then inside the retina is a gel substance called vitreous or vitreous humor, um, as everybody learns in, in high school. Um, so this is one way that we depict the eye to show structural changes. Um, the uh, other way, if you were to cut across this eye at the equator and then tip the bottom half towards you, you'd be looking into a satellite dish uh, kind of structure. And this is a, a photographic depiction of that view. And now you're looking right at the center of vision in, in the middle of the screen. And the structure that captures your eye because it's the most prominent is, is actually the optic nerve, the cable that connects the eyeball to the brain, just like the cable that connects the dish uh, uh, to the TV set. So here's a rendition of retinopathy of prematurity. And I'll talk about ROP because it helps you understand the structure of a, of a nori detachment. So um, blood vessels during uh, um, uh, embryogenesis enter the eye through the optic nerve at about 16 weeks. And it takes from 16 weeks to get from the optic nerve all the way out to that dark structure up front, which is called the uh, um, pars plana. Um, so when a child is born prematurely, you have some unfinished business. And that's that real estate that has the word avascular, which is our word for not having adequate blood vessel development, right? And so in ROP, depending on how premature the child is, you can have less or more avascular retina. And then along the interface between the vascular and avascular retina is where scar tissue grows. And here is a photographic representation. Again, now the eye has been cut and tipped towards you. You're looking into the satellite dish. In the center, you can see the, uh, the blood vessels. These blood vessels are a little bit abnormal in their tortuosity. Um, you can see the ring of scar tissue, and you can see the area beyond the scar tissue where there are no blood vessels, right? So vascular retina, avascular retina, and scar tissue betwixt. Well, why does that matter? Scar tissue in the body has a natural history. All scar tissue thinks that it's there to heal a wound. Therefore, it grows and it contracts. So um, you could see the circumferential ridge of scar tissue in the, in the uh, graphic that I showed you before, which you didn't see quite as well as that there are also transparent sheets that run from that ridge up into the eye and has a sort of very typical structure to it. And this is one of those things that took 10 to 15 years to figure out once we could get inside the eye because that's where you would see all the structure. Imagine then the different variants in anatomy you would have if it contracts a little bit on the right or just a little bit on the left or um, contracts totally. So here are partial detachments. The one to your left, the center of vision, this area here, remains uninvolved. The one to your right, also a small detachment, but it involves the center of vision. And then this is probably the most dreaded anatomy um, for a, a pediatric retinal detachment. This is what we call a funnel detachment, where that ring contracted like a purse string and then was brought forward, forward in the eye by those other transparent sheets that you saw in the graphic. So it took a, it took a while to figure all this out. Um, this is what these eyes look like. Um, and again, the eye to your uh, right is going to be familiar looking, I think, for many of the parents in the audience. The uh, image on the right is taken with the camera far enough away to get the lids and the cornea and the white of the eye. The image on the left is the same pathology, the same finding, just with a camera that you can put actually on the surface of the cornea, and you just take a picture of the scar tissue. Notice that these two children have different diagnoses but the pathology looks very, very similar. There is one finding uh, or one type of retinal finding that is really unique to Nori disease uh, almost exclusively. Um, persistent fetal vasculature and familial exudative vitreo retinopathy can have it, but the classic uh, diagnosis for this finding is Nori disease. And this is what we call uh, retinal dysplasia. 
Retinal dysplasia is a term we use when all the cellular elements that are supposed to be in the retina are in the tissue, but they're, on, they're not in order. It's a jumble. And structure and function are highly correlated with regard to how the retina works. So the more orderly all the you know, anatomy is, generally the better the function. That said, it's easy to underestimate the level of function when you look at an eye like this. So let me just orient you a little bit. The retina is that flesh-colored uh, sort of triangle, if you will, or blob in the back of the eye. There is some lipid around it because the retinal vessels normally are supposed to act like a hose. Blood comes in one side, leaves the other side, no leaking through the vessel wall. The blood vessels uh, in dysplastic tissue act like the soaker hose that you put in a flower bed. We had a little pinpricks in them so that some fluid, not the blood elements necessarily, but the fluid that blood floats in gets out through those little pinpricks. The body reabsorbs some of that material, the water and so forth, but the heavier molecules end up leaving, being left behind. The heavier molecules in this instance are fat, and so that's a little ring of lipid or fat around a dysplastic knot of tissue that we refer to qualitatively as a pumpkin. The thing you uh, maybe can't appreciate quite as well is right at the apex of that, just below inferior, there's a, a, an area that's out of focus, and that's because there's a stalk running from the pumpkin all the way to the front of the eye. So as a child grows, for example, that stalk doesn't grow. So one of the procedures we do for this is we interrupt that stalk, because otherwise, as the child grows, you get progressive detachment and that pumpkin turns into a teepee-shaped attachment in the back of the eye. And so I'll show you some before and after shots in just a little bit. So these are, these are information here that everybody here is quite familiar with. The ocular findings are typically severe. You know, most of the data we had on uh, nori disease were, was, uh, were published by Warburg over a couple of decades. Um, and uh, kind of established itself in our field as sort of the standard folklore, if you would, and that is that the affected boys are blind, generally by three months, the retinas uh, are highly dysplastic, you know, poorly organized. Um, uh, over time, typically 10 to 15 years, uh, tysis is a word that uh, describes shrinkage. So think of uh, a tysical eye to a normal eye. Um, uh, is kind of grape to raisin uh, sort of thing. It's the, the word we use for when the eyes get smaller. So let me share with you our experience uh, with vitrectomy for nori disease uh, over uh, the, the last couple of decades. And it includes both types of detachments, right? So we talked about two. We talked about the funnel, which is why I walked through the whole ROP story, retinopathy prematurity story. And we talked about the dysplastic pumpkin uh, type lesion. Uh, in the back of the eye. So in this group, the children had to have one of those two types of anatomy, and they also had to have a positive nori disease diagnosis, either genetically or by family history. And so uh, here's a before and after. Uh, so on your left, you'll see the pumpkin, and you'll see how it's out of focus because of how highly elevated it is. And then to your right, after the stalk is transected, the pumpkin actually collapses. And the collapse is important because you will get more functioning retinal tissue from around the rim as that flattens. So it's hard to believe by looking at this, but that child with the uh, eye uh, on the right after surgery could see 2200. 2200 is ambulatory vision. It's the letters just below the big E, really better than ambulatory vision at three years of age. Uh, here's another child. Uh, not quite as badly malformed uh, as the last child, and therefore post-op, even better anatomy. So the pumpkin can do well in terms of anatomy, um, but a little bit your how well you're going to do depends on what anatomy you're handed to up front. Um, we can make things look better. We cannot fix what God hath not wrought. So if the, we don't have enough formed tissue at the moment, there's no way to replace that or engender that. And here's the funnel-shaped attachment. To your right is an ultrasound. I know everybody in the room is probably familiar with the ultrasound of, of done during the course of uh, a woman's pregnancy. You can change that or adapt to that probe so you can do an ultrasound of the eye and get a good idea of the structural contents uh, of the eyeball. The funnel-shaped attachment here. Um, 
when the, the retina detaches in that fashion, it also will push forward the iris and the lens, and if the iris and the lens come into contact with the cornea, you'll see whitening at the point of contact, and you can see that uh, in this image here. But about half of the time, you can take an eye like the one that I just showed you, and take the lens out, enlarge the iris surgically, take the scar tissue away, and open that funnel detachment so that you get reattachment of the retina. And so you have an eye here uh, one month and then four months after surgery progressively reattaching. Kids are different than adults in terms of retinal detachment repair. If any of the adults in the room who don't have Norrie disease have a retinal detachment, that detachment is repaired pretty much on the table. Your retina is reattached. In retinal detachments in children, we remove the thing that is detaching them, which is usually internal traction, and then we allow them to settle on their own. In a child, it's important really to do something corrective to put the eye on the straight and narrow, but not to go in there sort of with guns blazing and, and, and try to, to fix everything at once because many times a child's eye can't withstand that dramatic an intervention. So it's really uh, a work of nuance. And as a consequence, multiple surgeries are common for kids who have Nori disease. So we had 14 children with a definite diagnosis. Sounds like a small number, but as you know, for Nori disease, that's actually a lot of kids. Um, outside of this group, in your hometowns, I'm sure you've not met 14 kids with Nori disease. All had vitrectomy and or a lensectomy. When, the, when a child has a pumpkin, you don't have to take the lens out. You can just cut the stalk. When the retina is detached to the funnel, the lens needs to be removed to fix the detachment. Uh, seven boys had at least uh, light perception in one eye, and to this day, our success rate at opening a funnel and getting light perception or better is about 50%, not 100%. So let's compare that to Warburg's experience. He did have a large cohort uh, of children. Uh, only 6% of those kids had some vision or we use as a surrogate for vision if the pupil constricts, because that tells you that you're, you've tested the circuit, right? If you, it's kind of like throwing the ball and hearing the snap of the ball in the catcher's mitt. If you flashlight and the pupil constricts, the presumption is there's some vision there because you have to have vision for pupillary constriction. In our series, 70% of the kids maintained at least light perception in one eye after vitrectomy, and only 8% became tysical, shrunk, as opposed to the uh, sort of conventional wisdom that virtually 100 uh, will shrink over time. So we fix about half of them, 50 to 70 percent. Light perception vision, sometimes form vision, occasionally you saw 2200. You can get a kid on the eye chart. Uncommon, but it happens. So you know, you'll commonly talk to doctors who will say, gosh, you know, that, that's not worth it. You know, it's an awful lot of work for an awful little. So why we obviously feel differently. You know, and, and here is just some of the reasons why. Um, first of all, children do remarkably better with low levels of vision than we imagine they will based on uh, kind of our extrapolation of how they should see. And uh, even a light perception adult doesn't function as fully as a light perception child. Um, attributed to the plasticity of a, uh, neuroplasticity of a child, a variety of explanations, but children do much more with much less, A. Obviously, light perception keeps that child keyed into the sleep-wake cycle of the rest of society. Sounds like a trivial thing, but as any of you who have a child who truly has no light perception, no, it's a, it is a non-trivial thing. And thirdly, you just ask the child. A child who has light perception, who is deprived of it, really vigorously objects. And this is without even addressing the issue of, you know, the uh, uh, average lifespan of a child born today is projected to be 100 years. I can't pretend to imagine what's going to be available to a child 10, 20, 30 years away. We're doing things now. The retinal microchip wasn't even you know, a fantasy uh, notion you know, when I started uh, in the business. And now, you know, indeed, it's being used in some children with hereditary retinal degenerations, not in Nori disease, but in some other conditions. So the, the, the more fertile the soil for the seed to fall on, the better one would imagine a child will do. So for all these reasons, we do pursue uh, light perception for the kids. So common, commonly believe that these eyes are unfixable, not invariably so. Um, 
and as I mentioned, uh, because of the complexity of the anatomy, uh, multiple surgeries uh, are common. Well, that's much of what we've done in the last, say, 20 to 30 years. Um, more recently, uh, we have uh, really expanded upon the work uh, in our lab that started from taking genetic samples, putting together a molecular genetics laboratory headed by, headed by Dr. Drenzer, taking a look at the different um, uh, forms of Nori disease, if you will, whereby the genotype impacts on the phenotype. And I think, again, many of you have done enough work in this to know the difference between the two. What is the genetic code? And then how is that genetic information expressed is the difference between genotype and phenotype. So um, one of the things that's been very helpful for us in terms of convergent evolution is that over the last few years, retinal imaging has really improved. We're able to do a lot of wide-angle imaging. So if you look at the, if you think of the eye graphic that I showed you before, in some regards, the eye is like a bowl with a lip to it. And a lot of the trouble in the eye is actually up under the lip of the bowl. And under, with the, some of the older cameras we had, that was harder to image. With some of the newer cameras, you get a pretty wide field shot, and that's represented here. Um, this is a, 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 a test known as a fluorescein angiogram. Fluorescein is a vegetable dye. You put it in, the, uh, in a hand vein, and it shows you the vascular structure of the retina in, in uh, a very high level of detail, much higher than you can see just by looking at a color picture. So that's why we do it. And uh, we have some of that information here, and I'll walk you through that. This is a, a picture uh, sent to us in 2000, a six-year-old girl uh, from a very good doctor in Florida. Um, uh, and the diagnosis is familial exudative vitreoretinopathy retinopathy, or fever. And a handwritten note uh, accompanied the, the image and had the question, what's going on here? <laughs> um, so as we were looking at this picture, kind of a light bulb went off um, because there are really three areas of abnormality here. Um, in the first one are fairly healthy uh, vessels, and you can see that in this uh, green area here. And then there's an interval area where the blood vessels are not normal. They're leaking the fluorescein dye. Remember, normal blood vessels are like a hose. They don't leak. Right here you're seeing blood vessels that have pinpoint leaks of the dye, and that's why they're um, flaring uh, a little bit. And then beyond that, you have an area where blood vessels have been lost. So it's a sequential process, right? Healthy vessels can become compromised, and when that happens, blood vessels shut down or are lost. So we have known from fever and other diseases that when we have an area of retina like this patch here that's white that doesn't have blood vessels and we have abnormal blood vessels behind them either that are leaking or growing new or neo blood vessels and neo blood vessels are abnormal. Neo blood vessels to normal blood vessels are like crabgrass to a nicely manicured lawn. So uh, they, don't, uh, they don't grow in the, ret the retina the way they're supposed to. They don't supply oxygen to oxygen starved tissues. They grow up into the gel. They carry scar tissue with them. They're fragile. They break easily. And remember, scar tissue thinks it's healing a wound. So the scar tissue, once it grows up into the gel, then contracts and gives you tractional detachment, right? So neovessels are not good. We usually address this in our field, less and less now with new medications and therapies, but historically by destroying the avascular tissue, the, the tissue that has no blood vessels, and in so doing, we shut down the chemical messenger that that avascular tissue is elaborating, which is the fertilizer for the, for the neo vessels or for the abnormal vessels. So historically, we've done that with laser. But by looking at eyes like this and seeing them as having three different types of blood vessels in terms of uh, their history with the disease, we started to get a better understanding of the disease. So it was discovered that both nori disease and fever shared errors in, in a pathway known as WINT signaling. WNT is WINT. WINT signaling involves a process, uh, is a process which involves a molecule binding to the surface of a cell and triggering the production of a large number of proteins that are needed by that cell to form blood vessels and to maintain them properly. The molecule that triggers, triggers normal vascular development via wind signaling in healthy newborns is called norin. 
Infants with nori disease either don't make norin, depending on how severe the mutation is, or the norin they make is flawed. Something in that genetic code is wrong, and therefore you'll get an abnormal molecule. So some of the work that we've done, our, I, I kind of spared showing you uh, publications and so on and so forth, but some of the work we've done in our lab, um, uh, Dr. Drenzer published this paper if anyone is interested, uh, showed that these uh, yellow areas here are called disulfide bonds. These disulfide bonds are very important to the three-dimensional structure of this protein. How a protein functions in the body is directly related to its three-dimensional structure. There's a lot of, um, uh, probably all, uh, um, you know, biological uh, reactions in the body uh, require a kind of lock and key relationship between the multiple components of that chemical pathway cascade. So. If a mutation causes an abnormality in a disulfide bond, then that is more likely to be a severe mutation because it's going to have a severe impact on, the, on in our drug and the three-dimensional conformation of the resultant protein. So that's what we call a genotype-phenotype correlation, right? Makes sense. So the conventional wisdom held that uh, nori-driven Wnt signaling occurred only in developing infants. Okay, that this is something that happened during embryogenesis, when organs were being formed. That, that's the logic. Because there's a number of things that are turned on and off during development that don't go on again later in life, right? We all know about the differences in, you know, cardiac circulation, and, you know, that's how people will get a, a hole in the heart because there's a, a hole that's there during uh, embryologic development of the heart that's supposed to close. And if you get incomplete closure or persistence of that atrial septal defect, then, you know, that's a disease. So, um, again, many thought that there's a, there was a Noren wave, if you would, that occurred during development that receded uh, after development. Well, we first wanted to investigate in the lab if we could turn on Noren, uh, which is a new notion. Um, driving wind signaling in older human cells, blood vessel cells, and, uh, and blood vessel cells kind of come in two layers. Um, the blood vessel is, is a, has a, a two-layered wall. It has an endo or inner a layer wall and has uh, an, an exo or outside wall. And endothelial cells are really some of the most important cells. That inner layer is the most vulnerable and the most important. So we wanted to see if we could turn that on and um, in older endothelial cells. We found that we could activate the process uh, by activating the proteins by, that drive wind signaling um, and the development of healthy vessels. So, and that's what you see uh, on the right uh, in some uh, older uh, cells uh, once you uh, applied norin to them. Uh, and I uh, think you can see that the vessel caliber, these vessels look more robust. They look more stout on the right-hand side, and that was the finding. So reflecting on what we learned in the lab, we wondered if we could repair these vessels medically, avoiding vessel loss and preserving visual function. So now, of those three areas of blood vessels that I, we, I just showed you, we're looking at that area that was in the red. These are vessels that are compromised, they're injured. Can we keep them from going away? And having that retina be like the one all the way to the far right, where it was avascular. So uh, to do that, you need to preserve the juncture between the endothelial cells, and these are called tight junctions. So leads us to the next experiment. So uh, on the upper left-hand side, are just normal cells. And you could use a stain, this bright green stain shows you their cellular walls, their cellular, uh, that, that lie between each individual cell. There's a, a molecule known as VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. And on the one hand, VEGF is normally present and it is responsible for maintaining healthy cells. However, in some diseases, for example, uh, severe diabetic retinopathy, VEGF levels go up and they damage the cells, and they damage those junctions between the cells. So on the upper right-hand side are cells that were exposed to VEGF, and you can see the cell walls have been damaged. They're virtually, I mean, and the dye, therefore, um, that stains uh, the walls is seen dispersed throughout the medium. So on the bottom right-hand side, if you, if you expose the cells to Norin, there's not much difference between uh, audience top left, audience bottom left, right? But audience bottom right, if you expose them to VEGF, you can rescue them with Norin, and they look fairly similar to the cells that have had nothing done to them at all. So Norin can rescue from VEGF damage, another important thing to know. Well, 
On the far right part of that uh, angiogram that I showed you was capillary loss. This is a slide that shows capillary loss. You can see the capillaries are like the fine hair-like roots uh, in a plant. And I think everybody learns in bio when you pull a plant out of the soil, that big thick root isn't where the business really happens. It happens at all the little fine hair-like roots and the human body is the same way. Down here to the right, the lower, lower right-hand corner, you see a darker area because the capillaries have all been pruned. But what if you could grow retinal capillaries in these spaces of capillary loss? That's what infants do during development. If you look at uh, an eye from a child that has uh, severe fever or severe anori disease, you'll see the larger vessels, like the trunk of the, like the main uh, root on a plant, but without all the hair-like uh, projections. And so clearly, over time, the body does form those fine capillaries. Maybe norin-driven wind signaling um, sort of facilitate uh, or uh, engendering an environment where you have norin and uh, can tip the wind signaling cascade, you might be able to engender capillary development in so doing. So first we show that norin can cause the adult human endothelial cells to grow in large numbers. Then we took it to a model where capillaries are lost. And this is called the oxygen-induced retinopathy model. It's a model that was really developed to help understand retinopathy of prematurity better. So what happens is if you take mouse pups and at uh, fairly early after they're born, you raise them in an environment where the oxygen level is high, the slide to your left shows that you're not developing capillaries between those large vascular trunks. But if you treat that pup and still put them in oxygen, you see norin allows for blood vessel development between all those trunks. So another sign that you can get blood vessel development in an environment where they typically won't develop when you add norin. And then, can you stop leaky blood vessels from leaking by adding norin to the environment? And then that was the next experiment. And so we showed that as well. So this represents an exciting potential new treatment for leaking retinal vascular diseases. Well, who has leaking retinal vascular diseases? Well, folks with nori disease, as they grow older, remember, uh, in the pictures that I showed you, I said, the body will reabsorb the fluid that is under the retina over time. And I think some of you have children that I've followed where they've developed more lipid under the retina over time. That's from leaking blood vessels. Norin would hopefully stem or mitigate the ongoing leaking. The ongoing leaking occurs all through life. So it, it's an important thing to be able to do if one can do it. But we were chatting earlier, you know, about how the population of children with nori disease is small. And in some regards, that poses, poses, in some regards, that poses a challenge to the development of new therapeutic agents because research is expensive and it's just a, a, a truism that, you know, you're going to spend your money on research generally. The biggest dollars go to the things that affect the most people. What if by addressing an issue that was germane to the children with nori disease, the results of those, of those studies were expandable or extrapolatable to other diseases. And in fact, there are a variety of other leaking diseases. Again, diabetic retinopathy from a population perspective is one of the biggest. 5% of the population in the United States has diabetic retinopathy. Interestingly, if you go to other populations, if you go to um, the Marshall Islands, the, some of the islands, 50% of people in the, Marsh, of the Marshallese uh, have a diabetic retinopathy. So now all of a sudden, you're going to be able to get the interest of pharmaceutical companies because there's plenty of drugs that the pharmaceutical company makes to treat diabetes and its variety of complications. So the result of this work is a new therapy which can grow retinal blood vessels properly. You've uh, probably started to hear the term regenerative medicine. This is something that is within the umbrella of that term. This is an example of regenerative medicine. So we're now ready to take Norigen, a drug that we've made, derived from Norin, uh, to the FDA, uh, where uh, we are going to start to enter human trials. So we have animal data, we have cell data, those are the things that you need first. And the next thing we need to do is start to do work in humans. We have to define what population of patients we're going to treat. We're probably not going to start with children with Nori disease because they are too rare and a little too fragile to be the sort of first in human uh, trial. You want folks who have sort of 
uh, eyes that have less wrong with them, and so on and so forth. So you can really judge the pure effect of the drug and kind of tease it from uh, the other complications of a disease. But that's how things start. And that sort of a treatment could bring meaningful hope, I think, to both pediatric and, importantly, in service of our interests, adults. <laughs> We're hoping to draft on the interest uh, in adults in, uh, in bringing Norigen uh, to clinical trial. So that's the advances, you know, big advances of the past, which were largely surgical, understanding pathology, developing instrumentation, and so on and so forth, and then moving to the lab, where we're doing what's called translational research, kind of targeting the, the laboratory research, not to just problems that are of intellectual interest, but don't necessarily have very much practical clinical bearing, but instead focusing on laboratory questions that will answer real life problems for the patients we take care of. That's the definition of translational research. Well, while we're busy doing all this kind of research, which offers exciting prospects for the future, um, the parents of the children we take care of are charged with raising their kids and getting them from you know, infancy to childhood and into school and dealing with their disabilities, vision, and otherwise. And so uh, from the community of people who were originally interested in our work primarily for our research, we have now expanded our mission to engender community amongst the parents and uh, individuals uh, affected with the conditions that we take care of. In some regards, this is another thing that uh, is um, possible by virtue of virgin evolution. It used to be that I would, and I've had this conversation with uh, many of you, uh, either you know one-on-one -on -one in the past or even uh, uh, this morning a bit, but it used to be that I would uh, see new patients with one of the conditions that are listed here, for example, on referral from a doctor. Increasingly, I see patients who have found us uh, on the internet. You know, when we talked about fever and nori disease. I mentioned that most doctors will see three to four in a lifetime. We follow a cohort of approximately 800 children with fever and nori disease. So we have a real sense every day of what the impact of the disease is and so on. And now, by virtue of, of social media and the availability of technology, you all talk to each other. You don't need to wait you know, for someone else to send you to me or for me to reach you somehow. You reach each other. And so, Really, uh, what we're hoping to do uh, with the um, Pediatric uh, Retinal Research Foundation is to help catalyze the sorts of interactions that right now happen in a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'll have a mom who comes in who has a two-year-old with Nori disease and says, gosh, you know, I'm not really sure what to do with uh, my son when he turns four. And I'll say, well, I have a parent who has a five-year-old with Nori disease. Let me contact that parent, ask their permission to put you two in touch, and, and almost invariably, I don't think I've ever gotten a no, those two folks will speak. Well, I, I, you know, we're looking to apply scale to that paradigm. So, and, and I think that's very much in the spirit of this organization, why you guys are here today, why you have a sister organization you know, now overseas. So we've come at this from the research side and recognized there was a big unmet need on the community side as well. I think you know you guys came at it from the community side and are interested in fostering research. So we clearly have significant overlap, and I think it's important for us to find synergies. Um, so uh, if you're curious, here's our uh, website. Um, uh, it covers all of the diseases, not just nori disease. But I think it's again important to reiterate our main research focus is nori disease. It's the overwhelming. Uh, majority of what we do on a research uh, level, um, but it will have impact on fever. It will have impact on adults with ROP who also have leaky uh, leaky vessels and so forth. And so, the the true um, leverage uh, of the therapeutic uh, pharmaceutical, I think, has yet to be realized. Um, may we have success in 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 bringing it to serve uh, the people we take care of with nori disease and otherwise. So. That's what I've got today. There's a lot of material. <laughs> it covers the kind of the 30-year arc of at least my career uh, so far, starting out primarily as uh, uh, someone 
um, who is a surgeon and just smitten uh, with the kids I, I take care of and moving towards, it's kind of a funny journey, you know, to understanding the biology, to drug development, to, to the importance of community. So thanks for your attention, and uh, again, thank you for having me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Too much data, huh? <laughs> yes. Um, I know your focus is on the eye. I, I don't know how it's delivered. Do you, um, you know, Nori disease affects beyond the eye as well, and presumably in the same kind of fashion beyond the eye that it does in the eye. Do you see that Norigen could have any impact beyond the eye? So, um, we, we do see that. So yeah, we had a conversation earlier about um, some of the other things. I know you've had some of the uh, ear people uh, here, um, and uh, I know that many of you are aware of CRISPR technology and its, you know, its, its, its promises. And um, uh, I, I would probably make the point that I uh, made in conversation uh, earlier today. I don't see these as conflicting technologies. I think see these as comp potentially complementary technologies, each attacking a different facet of disease. And I'm not dodging your question. I, I'm going to answer it. The, the short answer is that it's early days. And we don't really still understand the full potential uh, of uh, all of these therapeutic agents, nor their particular specific niche of application. Um, so I will say I think that there are, are um, dramatic potential synergies with the uh, folks in the uh, 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 ENT side of this equation, um, because again, it all has to do with Norin, and you know, so we have common denominators that a common denominator is quite robust. So, do I think, for example, that Norigen may one day be a therapeutic for the hearing aspect of Nori disease? I think absolutely that's possible. We're just still. We're still trying. <laughs> we're still trying to, you know, get momentum and escape velocity to do the I part, and so that's the only reason that I haven't got a uh, more mature answer in that regard. Is that we're not that mature yet, but I, 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 tr I truly believe so. There are other areas um, that have potential application with regard to Nor uh, Norigen uh, as well. Um, uh, that are really kind of beyond the scope. It could take a little too long to, to get into the biology of it. But uh, um, this issue of uh, being able to support capillary development is really a critical in a number of conditions. And it's kind of like the more you think about it, the bigger it gets. But um, may we be able to leverage with that kind of impact? I mean, that's really kind of the coolest thing, right, is to have a positive impact in somebody's life, much less a huge population. So. Kind of the challenge from the Nori's perspective, I'm going to step back and do a little bit of philosophy here. The challenge from the Nori's perspective is I feel like I'm a jeweler, you know, where each piece I have to make by hand. It would be great to be able to develop a therapeutic where it would not require my personal touch to have an impact and to make people better, right? Scale. And that's the challenge to what I do. And I, I love what I do. I, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy I know. You know. I have a great job. But I'm limited with regard to impact because I'm a jeweler. And Norigen offers an opportunity for scale. Long answer to a simple question. So we're thinking along the lines that you are. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that the, the vision is kind of palpable and accessible, that you kind of don't have to take too many more steps to see where it could go. So, it's exciting, you know. The corollary is let's you know have the reality chat too. Only three percent of drugs that are conceived at this phase, you know, that make it to this phase, actually make it to market. So we have headwinds, you know, ahead of us, and it's not always because the drug won't work. You know, sometimes it's funding. Sometimes uh, it's ha finding the right partners. Um, uh, sometimes it's being at the right place at the right time when there's that perfect storm of multiple circumstances that it takes to catalyze. You know, there is a fair amount of serendipity uh, to this, but you know, our only recourse 
is stay firm to the task, you know, eye on the prize, and keep, keep you know, plotting forward. So I'm not trying to be melodramatic about it, but that's the reality of it. You don't really know if you're going to, you know, you're going to succeed. Um, but the science is compelling. I mean, the cell data, you know, I know it's hard for non-scientists to look at the cell data, so I tried to get my starkest, you know, clearest cell data, and the animal data in kind, you know, this is sort of not mind-numbing when you show slides like that. Um, but the data are compelling. Um, so, and I think the need is real, and I think it's, it's good for us as folks interested in nori disease that there is a diabetes story here as well, because that's how we're going to get there. You know, when the macrogen, um, so the biggest family of drugs that has impacted on the, on the patient, patient population that I take care of, now I'm not talking about kids, I'm talking about all my retina patients, is the family of drugs that attack VEGF, that molecule that I mentioned earlier. So anti-VEGF drugs have really revolutionized retina care, primarily in the sphere of something called macular degeneration. Macula is the center of vision, Ma degeneration is self-explanatory, you know, it's generally age-related changes that occur in the center of vision. And there's a, there's, a, there's a wear and tear component to macular degeneration, but there's also another variant that has more dramatic impact on vision where abnormal blood vessels grow under the center of vision, the so-called wet type of macular degeneration. Anti-VEGFs have changed the clinical course of patients with wet macular degeneration. Prior to the anti-VEGFs, the average patient with the state-of-the-art therapies that we had, which included lasering the center of vision because losing a little vision now would be better than losing more vision five years from now. So really, imagine me convincing your dad, for example, that I should do a laser that was going to take his center of vision away because five years from now he'd be better off if he let me do that now. And that, we, we really did that. It sounds crazy, but we really did that. So, and that was one of the antecedent therapies. So prior to the anti-VEGFs, therapies like that, patients from when they walked in the door lost six lines of vision. So even if you walked in at 2020 and you lost six lines of vision, you weren't going to be driving. At best, with the therapies that were available at the time, you were still going to lose vision. So that happy macular degeneration patient, as I was discussing earlier, was an oxymoron, right? I have a lot of patients who are still driving. 90% of people who walk in the door now who are treated with an anti-VEGF have no further vision loss from the vision they have when they walk in the door, okay? Many of them walk in with better than driving vision, so 90% of them will still be driving. So it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, and that one therapeutic had a massive impact on, and it's not just macular degeneration, it's how we take care of some facets of diabetic disease, it's how we take care of when a vein gets blocked, and shuts off, or an art, uh, a vein primarily gets blocked and shuts off the circulation to the center of vision when there's radiation damage to the blood vessels that serve the center of vision, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that digression by way of saying it's not too crazy to imagine that one drug that happens to be um, well positioned with regard to the pathways, uh, biologic pathways in our body, can have a really dramatic effect that extends beyond the original notion. So we uh, started to try to use uh, this drug in some of the uh, pediatric uh, retinal diseases, and uh, now it's probably going to uh, it's probably going to be the mainstream therapy for retinopathy of prematurity. Um, this uh, this drug because it stops the abnormal blood vessel growth. The crabgrass that I talked about it's weed killer. It stops crab and the crabgrass is what you know scar tissue and abnormal blood vessels is what lines the kids with ROP. So again, a long answer, but Thank you. the vision's real. The vision's real. Yes. Boy, that's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, so here's here's the reason for my my pause. Um, we talked about VEGF, and VEGF is normally present. It's what's responsible for normal homeostasis, meaning kind of daily care of cells. But VEGF, when it's too high, is pathologic. And when it's too low, is also pathologic. And I think um, that's where the art would lie, for example, in using uh, uh, Norigen uh, in utero is number one, dose determination. Because until we start to use it in people, we'll, we really don't know whether, whether A, it has the therapeutic effects that we desire, or B, it's evil twin, or the adverse effects of the drug. 
you know, interestingly, the anti-VEGF drugs seem to have a, a very, and, and that notion, good versus bad effect of a drug, is what we call therapeutic index. Um, the anti-VEGF drugs have a great therapeutic index. They are the closest thing to what we call a silver bullet, right? The bullet that has, this bullet's got your name on it, right? It only treats what you want it to treat and has no other impact on anything else. The anti-VEGFs are kind of close to a, a silver bullet. So I don't know if we're going to have, you know, a, a silver bullet profile. Um, and I also don't, I think it's, it, you need to be realistic about what you expect the cell to do, the, the drug to do. So I think, for example, I don't think Norigen, um, and I don't know, right? I, re I really don't know yet, but I, I have a hard time imagining that Norigen is going to correct all the problems of Nori disease if given per se alone because the impact of the genetic abnormality is so broad and it may extend beyond just Norin. You know? So we talk, I don't want to talk about it the way people talk about stem cells. Like right now, or not right now so much anymore, I think people are getting more reasonable about what they expect from stem cells. But there was a while when you'd figure you could fix everything, you know, with stem, it would make your bed for you, it would, you know. <laughs> and people had this notion that you just put stem cells in that would somehow know what to do, you know. And I use the analogy when I talk to patients about it, you know, it's not like throwing a wrench at your car and hoping your car is going to fix itself. And I, it almost, that's the kind of, you know, uh, power that people in their minds invested uh, stem cells with, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's not that. And so I, I, I don't want to overpromise uh, as well. But we don't yet know what the potential is. I have a couple. Um, my brother was born in the mid-50s when rubella was mm -hmm. kind of at its height, and they thought my mother had rubella when my brother was born, and they said, oh, this will never happen in a million years, of course, before genetics and all that. And they, originally, they went to New York City to visit, I don't know, it's the big eye hospital in New York City. And he was written up in some of his, um, I think his name was Dr. Reese, Elgin yeah, Reese Elgin Reese. Yeah, Elgin wow, Reese. you're going yeah, way back. Yeah, my mother remembered his name forever. <laughs> and he was written up, and I actually looked up some of the studies when my son was first diagnosed. And, um, but they were studies about ROP. And so they first thought he had ROP, but mm -hmm. he was like eight pounds, seven ounce, full term right. baby. No pee. Exactly. No. Right. No prematurity. No prematurity. So it's really interesting that you talk about ROP with this. And then the other thing is, I'm an enigma because um, when Nathan was operating on at Johns Hopkins, I was dilated a hundred times probably by every resident. And so I have the avascularization in my left eye, and so I think that's really rare among carriers. It is. Um, so um, I have a retinal fold. It looks like a comet went through my retina, and so I'm, you know, I knew I was special, but you know, I didn't <laughs> know how much. So, in ways that maybe you didn't want to be. Yeah, yeah exactly. But so, you know, I, I'm, I understand that there's not many of us. Um, and there's also a couple people in our group. And by um, us, you mean affected carriers. Yes, yes. And there's a couple females that have Norris, mm -hmm. you know, um, full-blown, you know, um, blindness. So could you speak to that? Well, I can, uh, I, I can tell you that I'm always humbled by what I don't know, and this is an area that we don't know. I, by the way, Casey, I'm sensitive to time. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I'm around. Yeah, I'm going to stick around for a couple hours. I don't want to take, yeah. We're going to, yeah, we're going to set up for, um, for our next speaker, and so good. you guys can ask some questions, use the restroom, and then come back here. and just Yeah, good. I don't want to step on the next speaker. Of course. Yep.